be your host for today. It's so great to have so many groups joining us live today to be able to take these events and still broadcast them uh, live uh, into homes, uh, make sure that the learning's still happening, we're connecting uh, on so many different levels. So it's so awesome to be able to continue doing these uh, right. sessions live uh, right to you. So you are joining in today for a SciComm story time. So every day at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, we are connecting with amazing science communicators from across North America and beyond and learning about some of the really incredible work that they're doing to help bring science and media uh, to the public. So continuing on today, we have such an awesome speaker. We have Imogen uh, Cancellari joining us today. Imogen is a wildlife biologist and landscape geneticist researching rare and elusive species. So she studied wildlife all over the United States and around the world from bears to fishers to newts and is currently researching range-wide snow leopard genetics for her PhD at the University of Delaware. So she uses social media to talk about cool wildlife, which is all of it, and to help others learn about successful careers in wildlife conservation. Outside of her work, she enjoys finding salamanders, taco trucks and coffee shops and petting dogs. So Imogen, it's so awesome to have you joining us live today. We're excited to get to know you a little bit better. And then of course, we'll fire away with a little Q&A action. Awesome, thanks, Joe. Can you hear me okay? We got you loud and clear. All right, well, hey, everybody. I am coming to you live from my kitchen table in Newark, Delaware. Uh, despite the fact that it looks like I am being attacked by a hopefully friendly snow leopard, um, I am here to chat with you guys today about a couple of different things. So I'm gonna switch over to sharing my screen uh, for a presentation that I have, and then we will be able to uh, get cracking. So. Uh, as Joe said, I am going to be chatting with you guys today about some wildlife encounters uh, that are near and dear to my heart, but I'm also going to be chatting with you guys a little bit about how you can have your own wildlife encounters, regardless of whether or not you have a job like mine, or you are still in school, or wildlife, or the outdoors is just a hobby of yours. Uh, so I am currently a PhD candidate at the University of Delaware, and I am studying snow leopards, which is the cat that you are looking at in the photo uh, here on my presentation. They're a beautiful cat that ranges in Central Asia, and I am going to talk a little bit more about them as we get through this presentation. So just briefly as a background for me, um, I am a wildlife biologist by title and I really realistically work mostly with carnivores. So what you're looking at here are two anesthetized or a sleeping uh, via chemicals. We're looking at a black bear that I interacted with in Missouri and we're looking at a bobcat that I captured in Texas. So both of these animals are alive, both of them are healthy, both of them are safe, and I am also safe because they are anesthetized. The uh, bear here on the left side of the screen was a, a male black bear that we caught in Missouri as part of a project where we were trying to understand the population structure and the movements of bears in this part of the United States. And this was in the summer, but this bear weighed a whopping 390 pounds. Uh, so he was a big dude and uh, he was his head was really, really heavy. And um, I was able to take this photo as he was recovering from the anesthesia. So anesthesia is the same drug that we give to people when human doctors uh, perform surgeries. So it's always administered under um, trained, in, trained people that are supervising the health of the animal first, as well as monitoring the safety of people. And I throw these photos up here because prior to starting my master's and PhD, this is what I worked on. I was a wildlife biologist research assistant. And then when I started my master's, I focused on bobcats, which is what's on the right side of the screen. Um, and this animal, again, was captured as part of a research project. I was looking at genetic data. I was looking for genetic data. And so that's why she cap we, we captured her. So most people think, uh, when you think of wildlife biologists, you think of this, you think of people interacting with wildlife every single day, they're handling them, they're seeing them. But realistically, that is not always the case. More often than not, oh, there's another photo right there of me working with an American alligator. Um, I mostly work with carnivores. I have worked with um, some reptiles and amphibians. Uh, as Joe mentioned, I really like salamanders a lot. But over all of these experiences, I generally consider myself a carnivore ecologist. But like I said, this is not really the day to day for me anymore. The day to day, -to -day looks more like this, where I am either in the lab or I am setting, I am using tools that allow me to not be in the field all of the time. 
And this is really important for wildlife research because, well, you know, if you look outside of your window right now, like I'm looking out my window, I don't really see any wild animals. I know that they're there, but I don't see them. And so how are we able to study them safely? And how are we able to answer questions about conservation and management if we don't see them all the, all the time? The answer is non-invasive research. And what that means is we are collecting information about wild individuals or wildlife populations without ever having to come into contact with them. I'm not capturing them, I'm not holding them, and I'm not even really seeing them. And so this is really what my research has turned into over the last couple of years. And it's really beneficial for wildlife because that means we're not stressing them out. I mean, can you imagine being a wild animal walking around and all of a sudden you are being handled by people or maybe you are anesthetized with a drug? It might be kind of scary, right? So even though we're doing this under trained circumstances with people that have certifications for this and the animal's health is always taken care of, it's still stressful for the animal itself. And realistically, while we definitely need these types of methods to address conservation and management decisions, there are a lot of cool research questions that we can address without ever having to see the animal. And that's where my research comes in. And so some of the ways that we do that is with a method called camera trapping. And so what you're looking at here, oops, I don't know what happened. So what you're looking at here is one of my colleagues who is a trap, who's setting a camera trap in the mountains of Tajikistan. And he's basically holding a whiteboard in front of him to mark the date and time that he's starting to collect data. And so he's gonna leave. And then basically that camera is infrared camera is gonna be there all of the time while he's not there collecting data if an animal walks by it. And then he can use that for his research. These are the types of the questions that we can answer about wildlife include what species are there, how many are there, what type of habit, what types of habitat do they use, what types of interactions are we seeing within like a mammal community or predator prey interactions. And also we tend to sometimes get some funny things like this photo here on the left of a deer looking really confused because he obviously sees the camera. Or you can see really cool interactions like on the right, which is a group of gray foxes. And I'll give you a second to see if you can count how many gray foxes are in the photo. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and show them to you. There's one, two, three, and four. That's just the backside of a gray fox. There's a little family of them hanging out. And so the cool thing about this is that you can get information, like I said, about what they're doing, where they're going, but also dates and time. So you see at the bottom, there is a date, there's a time, and there's a temperature recording. And all of this is really useful information for understanding how wildlife interact with or perceive their landscapes. And so when we get, this is particularly useful because you can also take videos, and these videos are really helpful for wildlife researchers in basically giving us information about their behavior. Like where are these animals going? What are they doing? And also realistically, it helps us understand what, they are what they're willing to do or able to do without humans to stress or alter their behavior. So in this video clip, we're looking at a snow leopard who was walking up along this mountain ridge in Central Asia, in Tajikistan. And he or she is basically sniffing, or her and her babies are sniffing all along this, uh, this rock wall right here. And realistically, what she's doing is she's doing the animal version, or they're doing the animal version of checking emails. And so even though they don't have computers like we do, they are able to read messages from one another, like territory, uh, territory, um, uh, marks and they leave tracks and sign and these are really this is really important information for people like me because my job is to go out into the the woods or the forest or the desert and try to collect data that I can bring back to the lab to answer. And so that, that brings me briefly, I wanna talk about my dissertation. I am studying snow leopards, which is the gorgeous cat on the right. They are a large cat that is located in 12 different countries in Central Asia. And so what you're looking at on the left is a map of part of Central Asia with Russia at the top. And then there's China, which is really, really, really large here on this map. And all of this dark blue that you're seeing within the map is considered snow leopard range. So snow leopards are high elevation mountain specialists that live across 12 different countries in Central Asia. And so when I say that they're high elevation specialists, that means that they live really, really high up, usually above 12,000 feet in elevation and all the way up to 20,000 feet in elevation. And as a result, that makes it really difficult for us to follow them around and answer some of our questions about their uh, natural history, their behavior, their ecology. And all of these things are really important for their conservation. And despite being one of the most beautiful cats in the world, we really don't know a whole lot about them compared to many other species. And so if it's really difficult for us to follow them around or live collar them or to be able to get photos of them, 
one way that we, one tool that we can use in order to address some of these conservation questions is non-invasive technology. And so my questions around my dissertation incorporate genetics, which is non-invasive. That means that I go out into the field and I collect biological material from snow leopards, not on snow leopards, but things that snow leopards leave behind. And then I take them back into the lab to identify individual snow leopards, and then to kind of try to understand where are snow leopard families? Where are snow leopard populations? How are they connected between these different countries? How do the mountains help their movement? And what are those, what are those type, what does that type of information mean for their conservation? And so again, the way that I do that is by combining field and lab work. So I go out into the field and I collect uh, information that snow leopards leave behind. And then I bring it into the lab to try to answer some of these questions. But how exactly do I do that? Well, I'll tell you, I do that by collecting fecal material or cat poo. So I am, even though I am a wildlife biologist or a geneticist, those are fancy ways of saying that I go out into the, the field in the mountains and I pick up cat poo. And so basically what I'm doing is I'm using information from like camera trapping data or other experts that interact with snow leopards to go to areas where we know snow leopards might be. And I'm looking for snow leopard sign. I'm looking for scratches in the ground. I'm looking for tracks. And yes, I'm looking for fecal material. And so based on our understanding of where snow leopards go, I'm able to collect this data and then take it into the lab and hopefully help snow with snow leopard conservation without ever having to see a snow leopard. And so, yeah, it seems difficult. Like, well, you know, if it's really hard to find a snow leopard, how am I going to find snow leopard poo? Well, like I said, that's why using all of these different tools together makes it a little bit easier for us to actually go out there and find this genetic material. And so to do that, and then kind of to, to shift from that, I want to talk to you, I want to share two different stories with you that uh, I, that happened as a result of doing some of the type of work that I do. Uh, so this past year, I went to China. Let me see if it will play. There you go. Uh, in this past summer, last year, I went to China and I was volunteering with some of our collaborators who are also doing snow leopard research. And what you're seeing here is this beautiful mountainside that we worked on and that rock right there that I just zoomed in on is going to be kind of important here in a second. But the story that I want to share with you takes place on a warm July morning. Uh, this is currently in July in a part of the Tibetan Plateau in China and it snowed that morning and we were looking for snow leopards. We were hoping to see them. We knew that there was a female that uh, lived along this side of the mountain range and we were hoping to spot her. And we did. So when we were, before this video plays, I'll tell you the story. Basically we were driving along and looking for this snow leopard. And all of a sudden she came charging over the top of the mountain and died running down in the snow because she was hunting something, but we couldn't see what. And she disappeared until we saw a herd of blue sheep. So these are blue sheep, which is one of the main prey items of the snow leopard. And any second now, you will hopefully see a snow leopard if you look from the bottom of the screen. So we're about 300 meters away when this happened on the other side of the river. And this video is taken through a spotting scope by one of my colleagues. And we just witnessed her unsuccessfully try to catch some blue sheep. And this is kind of important because when we think about predators, we think about how often they are chasing or in trying to catch their prey because they're always in search of their next meal. And they're only successful about 10% of the time. And so this female, after she had chased off all of the blue sheep unsuccessfully, she crawls under this fence here and decides to uh, just basically take a break in the snow. And I don't know, I think that she saw us. We're from across the river. And then she walked all the way up to that rock that you saw in the last two videos where it was zoomed in, or where I zoomed in on that video. And basically what we're looking at here right now is this snow leopard just hanging out in the snow. And this is really cool because this was the very first snow leopard I ever saw. And this is an adult female that was lactating. I'll try to play that again. And what we can see that she's doing right now is she's scent marking. So she's rubbing up on this rock and she's leaving her scent. And right there, you see she lifts her tail. She's leaving another scent mark. She's spraying urine on the back of that rock. And what that means is, is those are basically wildlife emails. So if another snow leopard comes around, that snow leopard he or she will say, okay, well, someone lives here. This is their territory and they're actively monitoring this area. 
And so basically this, inform this interaction was really cool because it happened from a distance. Fortunately, we had a spotting scope to be able to see her. And it was really useful for wildlife research because the scientists at Shan Shui, Shui, Shui Conservation Center were able to document yet another uh, snow leopard in this area. They were able to document her using this area several times in a row. And we saw her hunting on more than one occasion. And then later, these re Chinese researchers could hike up to where this rock was and set camera traps to try to collect more information. Does she have cubs? How many are there? Can they identify her as an individual? And all of this is really important for conservation and management, um, in addition to the fact that it was just a really fun, fun, wonderful encounter. So shifting gears a little bit, can anybody tell me, or can anybody guess what this critter is? It's not a snow leopard. If you guessed bobcat, you would be correct. This is a little video that I found online of a rescued bobcat from the United States Forest Service, the United States Forest Service. And this uh, video reminds me of an encounter that I had during my master's research, where I was focused on bobcat genetic structure in Texas. I was trying to answer some of the same questions that I'm trying to address now for my dissertation research. And in this particular case, on one summer night, uh, it was not snowing, I got a phone call from a local uh, farmer who said that he had found a bobcat about this size wandering around in his yard. And his dog had found it. Unfortunately, uh, the dog did not hurt the bobcat and the bobcat did not hurt the dog, but he picked him up and uh, called animal control. And fortunately they knew that we were doing bobcat research in the area. So they had us come out and assess the animal. And so this is a little baby boy bobcat that we aged around six weeks old and he looked to be in good health. And so we wondered what exactly would a bobcat kitten be doing walking around at midnight by himself? Well, getting in trouble, no doubt. And we determined that based, because he was healthy that he probably wasn't abandoned. And so we decided that we should return him to where we had found him. And it's a good thing that we did because you can see in this photo that he's not really too happy with us. And the reason that he's not too happy with us is that is because wild animals don't like people. And this would be a great example of where interacting with wildlife is not fun for the animal itself. And what we were able to do is take him back out to the farm and return him to the burrow that we think where he was found. And he walked right into it and he disappeared and we never saw him again. And that's a good thing because when it comes to wildlife interactions, there are a lot of different ways that we can see wildlife without ever needing to uh, harass them or stress them out. And even if you're not a scientist, you can go out into the world and, and see wildlife yourself. So you can go into your backyard. Some wildlife species can be handled briefly if you find them, if you find them like under a rock in your backyard, like a toad, or you can help turtles cross the road if you have your parents with you and it's safe. Or you can even get out a pair of binoculars and look out in your backyard to find wildlife. A lot of wildlife are, a, are easy to find, but we are able to do that when we are respectful and we're quiet and we do it from a distance. And yes, even though my job is not necessarily interacting with wildlife on a day-to-day -day basis, having had these really unique experiences is something that I cherish and is something that hopefully can be used for good in the future to help other wildlife populations or other wildlife scientists with their own research. Um, but again, you can do all of this yourself. Granted, you might not see a snow leopard in your backyard because snow leopards don't live in North America, but you can see so many other different things if you just go outside and look. And before I take questions, one thing that I will say that's a really easy way to see wildlife is right now, since we're, you know, at home and, and we're not necessarily in school and things are looking a little bit different, is it's so easy to go online and look at live critter cams to see wildlife all over the world, whether it's eagles in a nest or it's live cameras on aquariums or zoos that are feeding their wildlife. It's a really great way, an easy way for us to just access wildlife and to see what they're up to when we're not there. And so if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, whether it's about stuff that you might find in your own backyard or if it's about any of my specific research. All right, Imogen, thank you so much for sharing. That's, uh, I mean, snow leopards are such amazing creatures and two things jumped to my mind right away. One, it takes you to some pretty beautiful locations researching snow leopards, so that's pretty amazing. And then congratulations on seeing one in the wild. That is incredibly rare. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty awesome that uh, you've been able to have experiences like that through the work that you are doing. Yeah, no, it was really, really awesome.
All right, so I want to give a few shout outs uh, in the chat sidebar. We have uh, Andrew, Ryan, Kyle, and Marie joining us in Surrey, British Columbia. We have Sal and Annabelle, both in fourth grade, joining us in Buffalo, New York. Hi, everybody. Uh, we've got Alfonso joining us from Peru and Chile. So we have lots of groups joining us. So don't be shy. Use the chat sidebar uh, and send us in some questions. And we've got a few popping in already. So let's get started with Surrey, British Columbia. They are wondering, what made you decide snow leopards? Yeah, so what made me decide to go into snow leopards? A uh, couple of different things. I've always been interested in carnivores. I got started wanting to be a veterinarian and I didn't realize for a very long time until almost I was done with, until I was almost done with college that there are so many different opportunities to make a career working with or studying wildlife or animals. It's not just veterinary school. And that was for me kind of my first important transition. And I've always been interested in carnivores. I think carnivores are amazing. They help structure ecosystems and they, you know, really, really have wide home ranges and they have to deal with a lot of different habitat and a lot of different people and a lot of different environments in order to meet their resource needs. So one, that's why I really like carnivores. Um, two, I love snow leopards because I love snow. <laughs> I mean, plain and simple. I just love cold environments. And I think that wildlife species that specialize or navigate or live in uh, environments where they need to be adapted to really harsh environments are fascinating. And the snow leopard is no exception. They are called snow leopards because they're high elevation snow specialists. And there's so many questions that we don't know about them. Um, not only are they fascinating, but because there's so much we don't know, they are great candidates for using some of these non-invasive tools that I am using, like genetics, to better understand how they're related, where they're going, and what does that mean for their conservation. Um, and so realistically, being able to do this PhD project, working with the groups that I do, is a dream come true as a result. All right. Awesome. We've got some great questions coming in. Here comes another one. Uh, this one is from Jason Zhang, and he is wondering, what is winter like in snow leopard habitat? Do their prey uh, animals migrate? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it's it can definitely be cold year round, as you saw from that one video where I, did, I showed you the mountain that was covered in snow. It wasn't a lot of snow, but it was July and it was very it was chilly in the morning. I definitely needed a jacket. Um, so in the winter, it the terrain just completely changes. We're talking, you know, 10, 12, 20, you know, feet of snow in some areas because we're up, you know, we're basically closer to the sky. We're at the top of these mountains above tree line. And what that means is that not all wildlife species can really traverse that landscape. And so a lot of species come farther down the mountain where there is less snow and they have a better chance of finding water, finding food underneath the snow because they're hopefully there's less snow as you go lower in elevation. And realistically, that means that they're, able, they're better able to try to escape predators. Um, snow leopards can effectively do it all. They are designed to live in the snowy environment. They've got really large feet uh, that, act, that act kind of like snowshoes that help them kind of float and navigate on top of the snow. And their long tails are kind of like boat rudders that help them, they turn their tails really fast. So when they're running down a mountain, whether it's on the rock or in the snow, they can navigate rather quickly. And so yes, the snow leopards ultimately are limited by their prey availability. So in the winter, when their prey start to go to lower elevation, the snow leopards will do that too. All right, great question. We've got fourth graders hanging out with us in West Virginia. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, and they're curious about whether the snow leopard is in fact your favorite animal or is there another species that steals that place in your heart? Okay, two things. One, I am very excited to share with you guys in West Virginia that I will be moving to West Virginia fairly soon because someone in my family got a really cool job in Shepherdstown and we are going to be relocating there. So that means that we'll have to connect in the future, guys. Um, the set to answer your actual question though, are snow leopards my favorite? Ooh, I think that I'm pro it's gonna it's a hard it's a hard way to answer it. I'm having a hard time answering that question because really it's a tie between three different things. Yes, snow leopards are my favorite. Yes, bobcats are also my favorite and you'll notice those are two cat species. but my third favorite species or a group of uh, species are salamanders. So there's a lot of different salamanders that you can find in the United States and in parts of, I guess, Southeastern Canada 
and they're just amazing amphibians. I love them. They're super cool. You know, they breathe through their skin. Some of them live in the water. Some of them live, you know, on terrestrial habitat under logs. And I think that even though that they don't, you don't have big claws and big teeth, they're just as cool as some of your big, you know, big mammals. All right. Awesome. Good question. Good answer. Good question. So Buffalo, New York, our fourth graders who are joining us, they're curious about, um, oh, where did that question go? Oh, there it is. So they're curious about, um, oops. Okay, there we go. So uh, actually I'm gonna jump to a different question here. Indigo Polecat is wondering about snow leopards and the mountains. Are they only found at the higher elevations or do they ever come lower? Yeah, so um, depending on where they are in Central Asia, they do live at lower elevations. So for example, in the Southern Gobi region of Mongolia, snow leopards can be found at relatively low elevation, I think as low as uh, 4,000 feet in elevation, which is really, really low. Whereas if you are in somewhere like China, like where I was, snow leopards are up to 15,000 feet and higher. And so, you know, that depends, you know, what those two differences depend on location in terms of their distribution. And then there's also seasonality, like we said earlier. So sometimes in winter, the snow leopards will go at lower elevation, but only because they're prey due. And then at summer, in summer where there are, when there is no snow, it's not really physically limiting for their prey and the prey go up and the snow leopards do as well. Okay. Um, I tracked down that question from Sal and Annabelle in Buffalo, New York, and they're wondering about uh, two things. They're wondering about, were you lucky enough to see any cubs? And what other wildlife uh, do you get to see when you're in China? So I have not seen cubs. We had one day where we were really, really sure it was this. So the female that I showed you a little video clip of, uh, we, we saw her twice uh, dur during my trip. We saw her hunt twice. That first video that you saw where they were hunting blue sheep, which is a main prey item for snow leopards in China. And we also saw her on another day on that same kind of mountain uh, face, charging downhill in the in the wildflowers, trying to hunt a marmot, which is a large bodied rodent. I, it's like a lot bigger than this book. Marmots are, you know, like big old loaves of bread. And in the summer, they are really important prey items uh, for snow leopards, particularly females as they're nursing their cubs. And so, we didn't see cubs because when I was there in July, the cubs that are born are only about six weeks old, which means they're not old enough to be out of the den to follow mom around. And realistically, people who see cubs don't see them until usually around late September. And I have had colleagues that have been lucky enough to see mom and cubs together, but unfortunately I have not. It's on my bucket list though. Hopefully one day. All right. Fair enough. Well, we're all rooting for you uh, <laughs> here. Let's see, let's go, Kazim is joining us. Kazim is a fourth grader as well. And he's wondering how long you have been a wildlife biologist for. Oh, I feel like a long time. So I got my bachelor's degree in 2010 and I started working as an assistant research or as a research assistant for various wildlife projects as soon as I graduated. And so I've been working in the field since then and I've been doing wildlife field and lab projects, I guess for 10 years. This summer in June will be 10 years. And I'm still in school, so <laughs> all, as soon as I, when I'm done with the PhD, I will not be in school, but hopefully I will still be able to be a wildlife biologist. All right, very cool. Well, Lily uh, Bernstein is joining us. She is a sixth grader in Washington, and she is wondering about snow leopards uh, living together. Are they pretty solitary, or do they ever kind of live and hunt together? That's a great question, and it's something that we don't 100% know. We know that most carnivores are solitary. However, the social structure of carnivores is a little bit less solitary than we previously thought. So for example, mountain lions here in North America will often share kills with one another, meaning that if I go, if I'm a mountain lion and I go and I, you know, killed a deer, maybe I will let my neighboring mountain lion come and have some of that food. That way in three months, when I haven't had anything to eat in a week or so, maybe this mountain lion is more likely to share something that she killed with me. And so this is something that we think happens in a lot of different carnivore species. We just haven't documented it. Um, and snow leopards are not really any exception. The males and the females are often solitary throughout the year. Obviously the mother will have cubs, but when I was in China, the, that mountain face that you guys saw in the video, another day we drove up because we were there a lot and we saw a, a, a snow leopard sitting on the grass and we, we looked in our spotting scope and noticed the face was entirely different. 
and it was a totally different cat. The cat got up and walked away, and it was a male. It was a male snow leopard, um, and we think it might have been the father of the cubs that the female was taking care of. And we knew that she had cubs because we saw in some of our videos that we could see that she was lactating. So she had engorged nipples under her belly. Um, and so we think realistically that that is probably the father, otherwise she wouldn't have tolerated him. And we think these types of interactions happen more often, uh, you know, females tolerating males or sisters or mothers and sisters tolerating and having overlapping territories, which is really cool. All right. Well, great questions coming in from online. It's so great to see classrooms joining us coast to coast, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, let's see. There's a good follow up here. I like this one about, um, you know, I, I can think of a few species off the top of my head, but do you know how many different species of leopard there are? Oh, OK. So obviously we have got snow leopards and common leopards. But within the common leopard complex, you've got several different species. So there's the African leopard, there's the Amur leopard. I don't know if the Indian leopard is considered a subspecies. Joe, you said you can think of a couple, so I'm gonna have to see what you have to say. <laughs> well, you got some of them, but there's a clouded leopard that I was oh. thinking. Of. Yes, there is a clouded leopard. <laughs> yeah. So I think, and then is there an Amal leopard? Am I am I right? There's there? the Amur leopard. Amur leopard. I think that's what I'm thinking of. Perfect. Well, I think it's pretty good. I think we named a few between the two of us. Not too. The leopards shy. are cool. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, and I like this question too. This is from our West Virginia group. They want to know about how many countries uh, your work's taking you to, your research. So I've been fortunate to be, I've gone to three different countries. Um, I have done field work in China twice. Um, I've been to China three times, but I've done field work twice. Um, I have been to Kyrgyzstan twice um, doing field. So I did a field uh, expedition in uh, August of last year through National Geographic. We were collecting samples in an area that uh, previously hasn't, hadn't been sampled for genetic data, um, which was really awesome. And I was also fortunate enough to work with my funding organization, which is a uh, US-based NGO called Panthera that does big cat or wildcat research. Um, and we worked with a group in Uzbekistan to try to help establish a genetics lab for wildcat and just wildlife research. So I've been to those three countries. I'm hoping to go back to China and I'm also hoping to go to India as well. All right, very cool. Well, look, uh, Imogen, I shared uh, in the chat the link to your website. Awesome. Uh, do you want to share a little bit more how students could maybe follow along with your work? Yeah, absolutely. So if you are interested in learning more about snow leopards or specifically about how maybe you could be a wildlife biologist, like whether what kind of experiences are helpful for college or what to do in college or how to find wildlife in your backyard, um, you can find me on social media. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can also find me on Instagram. And so those, uh, I let's see, I think I just threw them up here on the presentation. I'll share really quickly as I'm chatting since we're here at the last at the last bit of it. Um, so that's Biologist Immo on Twitter and Biologist Imaging on Instagram. My website is also a really great way to answer some questions that you might have. And there's also a contact form if you would like to reach out to me directly um, to chat about wildlife as well as career questions that you might have. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And that's a good segue to one more question I'd like to ask. Uh, any future explorers, scientists, conservationists tuning in, do you have any advice for them? Yeah, if you are interested in doing any kind of wildlife or outdoor work, my recommendation is to start now. Yes, I know we're in a weird time. Everything is different. A lot of us are at home. So some of these opportunities are currently on pause, but it won't be forever. And there are certainly things that you can do right now at home. And one of those things is definitely talking to scientists. So doing what you're doing right now is a great start because it helps you start to figure out what you might be interested in. And then when it comes to school and experiences, once you are able to, like either you're old enough or you have the time or you have the resources to try to apply for an internship or a job, doing those experiences is really critical in order to be able able to get a job or to get into grad school for this type of work and say you're interested in snow leopards. You know, I was always interested in big cats, but I haven't only done that. I've worked on foxes. I've worked on snake projects and turtle projects, and I've worked on bear projects. And all of these, I took all of these jobs because my goal was to develop skill sets that might be useful for conservation down the road. And so, yes, I love snow leopards, they're awesome. I've been fortunate to see a couple, but that's not really the bulk of my job. My job is working in, a, you know, combining field and lab work. But the reason that I'm able to do the work that I do is because I have skills in 
genetic techniques. And those techniques are currently something that we are, those are tools that we need to address conservation questions. And so for you guys, it's about answering cool questions. Like how, you know, if you're interested, maybe you're interested in diet, maybe you're interested in movement, maybe you're interested in quantitative stuff, or maybe you're, hopefully you're interested in genetics and developing these skill sets through different projects or different species is going to help you get where you want to go. All right. Great advice, uh, Imogen. Before we do sign off for today, I want to shout out tomorrow, SciComm Storytime. Tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 uh, a.m. Pacific, you can join us with Marin Hunsberger. So Marin's a microbiologist, uh, science explainer who loves making videos about science, especially tiny, creepy, crawly, germy things. So that should be a lot of fun tomorrow to join us with Marin uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern. Huge shout out to our YouTube groups today. Great to have groups joining us from coast to coast and sharing some awesome questions. Hopefully some future biologists out there. And Imogen, thank you so much for spending a little time with us uh, and sharing your story with us on uh, SciComm Storytime. Awesome. Thanks, guys. It was so much fun. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. Bye. <laughs>